and join us in singing hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses. Thank you for joining us here in person and thank you for joining us remotely by Zoom, where we will continue live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel for our virtual attendees. I'm Grace Preuss, a member of the worship committee, and I will be your worship associate today. Other members of the worship committee you will hear from include Tinka Friend, who will be delivering our sermon, and Alec Peck, who will be singing our hymn. We welcome you to join us this Father's Day morning with an open mind and an open heart and with muted electronic devices, please. Today, we honor, celebrate, and thank all the father figures in our lives. We are because of them. They are because of us. Now let's take a brief moment to reflect on and appreciate all the lessons they have taught us and all the things that they have shared with us.
June 19th is also the day that we observe the federal holiday of Juneteenth, what can be called America's second Independence Day. Although the Emancipation Proclamation declared all enslaved people legally free on January 1st, 1863, it was not implemented in places still under con Confederate control. As a result, in the Confederate state of Texas, slaves would not be free until much later. Freedom finally came on June 19, 1865, when some 2,000 Union troops arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas. The Army announced that more than 250,000 enslaved people in the state were free by executive decree. This day came to be known as Juneteenth by the newly freed people in Texas. On December 18, 1865, the 13th Amendment was adopted as part of the United States Constitution and legally abolished slavery as an institution in all US states and territories. Now let us observe a moment of reflection for this significant day. We now invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship today is inspiring and powerful. Together we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate and wiser as we begin a new day and a new week. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. So while we are in the sanctuary, uh, please keep your masks on and socially distance. And now I invite you to sit back and take a slow, deep breath as we move into the worship hour. For our call to worship, you are welcome to read with me the lyrics of Willem de Witt Hyde. Since what we choose is what we are and what we love, we yet shall be. The goal may ever shine afar the will to win it makes us free. Our speaker today is UUCR member Tinka Friend. Tinka Friend is a longtime member of this church. She is a docent of our church and interested in its history, as well as the history of Unitarian Universalism. She is a retired school teacher and in 2015, to honor the 50th anniversary of the march from Selma to Montgomery, she and her husband, Nick, made a two month trek across the South, visiting all the civil rights museums in four states, including the Selma, Alabama memorials to Viola Liuville and Reverend James Reed, two Unitarians who were murdered following Bloody Sunday. It was then that Tinka became determined to learn more about both of them. Reverend James Reed, what is required of us? On Monday, March 8, 1965, the day after Bloody Sunday, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King sent a telegram appeal to all faiths, urging clergy and all people of faith to come to Selma, Alabama to support their efforts of establishing equal voting rights. Reverend James Reed left Boston and arrived in Selma the following morning. By that evening, he lay unconscious in a Birmingham hospital with severe brain trauma after being beaten with a bat by a group of white supremacists. What kind of person lays down his life for people he has never met before? 
On this Father's Day, let's see what kind of a man James Reed was. We have two lightings of sacred flame. The first is the occupied indigenous people's remembrance candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign peoples, the original people of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupy was first the sacred space of several groups of indigenous peoples, including the Kawiya, the Kukenyo, and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light the sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and an opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to be part of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Today's reading of the chalice lighting is the larger circle adapted from Wendell Berry by Tinka Friend and read by myself and Tinka Friend. We clasp the hands of those that go before us. And the hands of those who will come after us. We enter the little circle of each other's arms. And the larger circle of each hands are joined and the largest circle of all, humanity, passing in and out of life, to the sound of heartbeats that is so vast that no ear hears it, except in fraction. Greeting our guests. We have a tradition at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. We know it can be uncomfortable to stand up and speak in front of others. And so I will now ask for a volunteer from someone who has been here a while to tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic and speak into it directly and clearly so that everyone can hear. Oh, we have a volunteer. Hello, Pat. This is Pat. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pat Kowunder. I first came to this church in 1984 when this wonderful person, Joanne Anderson, was teaching Tai Chi in the parish hall on Saturday mornings. It was five years before I ever looked in here because I was so phobic about church. Anyway, I did come and I joined and it's wonderful. Good morning. Thank you, Pat. And that's how it's done. So if you are new here, a visitor or an old friend, please raise your hand to stand and come up to the mic in front of the pul pulpit. Do we have any new visitors here? Welcome. Good morning. Good Hi, morning. I'm Mike. Um, I come to be here. I'm here today um, because I have two friends, um, Tinka as well as Nick. Um, and uh, through my relationship with them, I know they're, uh, they've been very helpful to me in my relationships. And um, I've been here once before, um, but it's nice to be back on Father's Day, and I think it's a great topic, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Is there anyone else who'd like to introduce themselves? Okay. Adam, is there anyone online who would like to introduce themselves? Thank you. 
For any other new guests, please join us for socializing and coffee hour after the service. We'd love to chat with you out in the parish hall where you can also find our visitor's book. So please leave your name before you leave so that we know you are here and leave your contact information if you want to know about upcoming events. For those online, the best way to get added to the mailing list is to email the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Now there are a few announcements we would like to share. During the service, we will mention several websites, email addresses, and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all of this information, and it is also available on our website. Joys and concerns. Sharing joys and concerns is one of the imp most important rituals in our community, an opportunity to share milestones, losses, achievements, and experiences with one another. Now that our doors are open again, on the first Sunday of each month, we can both hear from those in the sanctuary and leave, read the contributions that we have received. In front of the pulpit, there's a book where you can write your joys and concerns whenever you are here in the sanctuary. For those of you at home, you can, spend, you can send your joys and concerns throughout the month to uuchurchofriverside at gmail.com. Our next joys and concerns will be on July 3rd. Today is the third Sunday of the month, which means it's the sweetest week, week of the month. Our bake sale is going on in the parish hall after the service. Please treat yourself and support our church as all proceeds will be donated to the UUCR fund. The Social and Environmental Justice Committee is meeting today in the Annex at 12 noon. You can find the Zoom link and more information on the website under Social and Environmental Justice. Our hymn now is number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath from the Gray Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but again with your masks on. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing just as long as I have breath. This portion of our service is called Sharing Our Stewardship, and it is to support our beloved historical church. This can be accomplished in several ways. In addition to the weekly collection, you may send your checks to the church address, which is shown here. You may contribute by PayPal using the QR code, which is on the church website and also in the newsletter. 
Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater grocery cards, which we will have in church each Sunday. You will get the full value and the church also receives a percentage. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. And we thank you for your generosity. And to those who give of their time and their talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. I would like to offer these moving words by Reverend Brandy Lovely. Some of us in this room remember him. He helped guide this church at the turn of this current century. So let his words lead us to a place of gratitude, of generosity, and of reverence for this holy space. And here are his words. Let there be an offering to sustain and strengthen this place, which is sacred to so many of us, a community of memory and hope, for we are now the keepers of the dream. So will ushers please come forward to receive the collection? Thank you. Our next hymn is number 402, From You I Receive, from the Gray Hymnal. <clears throat> Feel free to sing as the, move, as the Spirit moves you, but please only with a mask on. We do this every week, but today I'm doing it a little bit differently. I want to emphasize the fact that um, each of us have a voice, and that voice um, has movement. It, it can move people. And I want to exemplify the difference between us, our own single voice and that of put, blending our voices together. So what I'd like to do is layer this song this morning. So what that means is we're going to add more voices each time that it's repeated. It's repeated three times. So we will use um, these three sections, this one, this one, and then this section over here. So we'll start with the section on my right. Then when we repeat it, we'll add this middle section. And then the last time we will add this, which will be everybody together. And you can see the difference in the volume and the intensity and um, when we put all of our voices together. So please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing from You I Receive. Please be seated. Our meditation today, um, I wrote 
in honor of James Reed's life and sacrifice. It is the response of reading, which will be followed by moments of silence. So um, I, will write, I will read uh, the regular text and you will please read the words in bold. How do we answer the question, what is a life worth? Ask those who brought him into this world. Ask those who molded and shaped him. Ask the one who vowed to be with him for a lifetime. Ask those who kissed him goodnight before going to bed. Ask those who eagerly awaited the stories he read. Ask those who taught him and trained him. Ask those whose lives grew spiritually because of him. Ask those whose lives were enhanced by his actions. Ask those whose lives were forever changed by his sacrifice. Ask those whose eyes were finally open to injustices around them. Ask those who now understand a deeper love because of him. What is a life worth? How can we know? Now let us pause for a moment of silence. So Reverend James Reed, one good man, that's what Lyndon B. Johnson called him, what is a life worth? World-changing moments and movements are not inevitable, but instead they consist of the collective decisions and actions of individuals. Unless the forces are nearly balanced, the impact of individual actions are sometimes hard to see, hard to measure. Occasionally, the actions of a few people move the center of the balance past the tipping point and everything changes. Such was the martyrdom of Reverend James J. Reed, Jimmy Lee Jackson, and Viola Liuzzo, two of whom were Unitarian Universalists. Back in March during Women's History Month, I gave a sermon on Viola Liuzzo and was asked if I would do a sermon on Reverend James Reed as well. So today is that day. Today is Father's Day, and I wanna thank you for choosing to spend part of that day in fellowship with us. So how many of you have a father that is still living? Is there anyone? Raise your hand if you have a father still living. How many of you are blessed to be able to see your father today? And how many of you, just like James Reed's children, no longer have a living father? When I was researching about the Unitarian minister, Reverend James Reed, and preparing for this sermon, two biblical stories or teachings came to my mind, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. And I'm gonna start with the one from the New Testament, and then I will end the sermon with one from the Old Testament. I'm sure all of you know, whether you grew up in a religious Christian home or not, Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel of Luke. When Jesus was asked by a lawyer about God's law, Jesus boiled the essence of God's commandments down to two, love God, love your neighbor which, by the way, is the teachings of Jesus that the Universalists followed. The lawyer further challenged Jesus by asking, well, and who is my neighbor? 
Well, Jesus expanded the story by telling about a man, presumably Jewish, who was robbed, stripped, and beaten, and left with nothing by the side of the road, half dead. Later, he was passed over, first by a Jewish priest, and second by a Levite. A Levite was a high, uh, a Jew of very high status. But both did nothing to help this man. And in fact, they crossed the road to avoid even having to pass near him. But then a traveling Samaritan saw him. Now, Samaritans had a lower status than Jews, and they had different religious beliefs. In fact, their beliefs were often in opposition to Judaism. So suffice it to say that Jews and Samaritans were not friendly with each other. This Samaritan was moved, however, with compassion when he saw this beaten man. He came to him, he cleaned his wounds, he put him on his own horse, he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And when the Samaritan left the next day, he paid the innkeeper to feed and care for the injured man until he returned. In my own religious belief, I summarize the message of that parable as, I am my brother's keeper. And I believe that James Reeb and all the others who heard Dr. Martin Luther King's plea for support and went to Selma believed in that message of the parable. Who was James Reeb? What kind of a man was he? What was he called to do? What was required of him? James Reeb was born in Wichita, Kansas on New Year's Day, 1927. His family was poor and they moved often while his father searched for work. Eventually they settled in Wyoming. James was a very sick child and his early life was challenging. As a result of a debilitating battle with rheumatic fever, much of his childhood was spent flat on his back, trying to take the pressure off of his heart and his lungs. Because of this, he had a very frail frame and an awkward appearance with thick glasses and slightly crossed eyes. Recognizing his physical disadvantages, his mother was determined that he be given every opportunity to excel personally, religiously, and within his education. And so he did. His teachers and fellow classmates recall him as being a passionate, morally committed, well-spoken, and above all, a courteous young man. It was obvious he had a knack for debate, often defending his beliefs against the majority opinion. How many of us can relate to that? He attended St. Olaf's College in Northfield, Minnesota on the GI Bill and met Marie Deason, whom he married in 1950. He entered Princeton Theological Seminary to become a, a Presbyterian minister. It was there that he served as chaplain at Philadelphia General Hospital, where he dedicated much of his time to poor African American patients, ensuring that they received the necessary medical care, as well as chapel services. And he often intervened to make sure that happened. After graduating in 1953, James continued working at the hospital and he also volunteered with inner city youth through Philadelphia and in Philadelphia through the YMCA. There he abolished the racial quota system, implemented integrated busing and created multiple family and youth organizations to set kids and their parents on the right track. It was during this time that he became a father. He and Marie had four children, two boys, two girls. Converting from being a Presbyterian minister to Unitarian in 1958, James wrote in the application for reordination, quote, I want to be a Unitarian minister because the church does not prescribe for people what the ultimate outcome of their religious quest must be. Rather, the Unitarian faith attempts to create fellowship 
that will strengthen and encourage each member in their desire and determination to live the truth as they see it. He was granted fellowship as a Unitarian minister in 1959. And you'll notice he was a Unitarian minister. That's because in 1959 was before the merger. In 1961 was when the Unitarians and the Universalist faiths merged together. Social ministry became James's passion as opposed to the parish minister or preaching sermons from the pulpit. He wanted to get in there and actually do something to change people's lives. He and his family moved to Washington, D.C. to become assistant minister at All Souls Unitarian Church, which was located in a poor Black neighborhood. There, he organized the University Neighborhood Council to address the growing social needs of the neighborhood surrounding the church, and soon dedicated the majority of his time to social issues. So, ultimately, he left the pulpit to pursue social ministry, and he moved to Boston to work for the Quaker-run American Friends Service Committee, settling with his wife and four children in Roxbury, which was a ghetto neighborhood in Dorchester. And that was against the advice of the other ministers that he knew, Unitarian ministers. The Reed family was just one of just a few white families in Roxbury. His children attended the local schools, and he felt that he could not preach nor create change if he himself did not experience the disadvantage of the people that he was working to help. Was there, he took up the cause of low-income housing, launching a public campaign for the new safety, for new safety, and worked on equalizing housing codes in the early 19, in 1965. Once again, James Reed was focused on helping the more unfortunate of his countrymen. It's not surprising then that he was appalled by what he and Marie saw on their family television the night of Sunday, March 7th, 1965. They witnessed the same thing Americans did all across the country and indeed all across the world, the brutal beating of peaceful black people in their Sunday best after church walking in a march for the right to vote and to protest the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson just weeks before. In the early hours of Monday, the next day, <clears throat> March 8th, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dispatched a telegram to all organizations of faith across the United States, one of which included the UUA in Boston. That's the Unitarian Universalist Association. That's where its headquarters is in Boston, where James Reed was. And that telegram read, in the vicious maltreatment of defenseless citizens of Selma, where old women and young children were gassed and clubbed at random, we have witnessed an eruption of the disease of racism which seeks to destroy all of America. No American is without responsibility. All are involved in the sorrow that rises from Selma to contaminate every crevice of our national life. The people of Selma will struggle on for the soul of the nation, but it is fitting that all America help to bear the burden. I call therefore on clergy of all faiths representative of every part of the country to join me for a minister's march to Montgomery on Tuesday morning, March 9th. In this way, all America will testify to the fact that the struggle in Selma is for the survival of democracy everywhere in our land. And it was signed Martin Luther King Jr president of Southern Christian Leadership Conference. James Reed was a member of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 
James was in his office when the call from UUA came in around noon. He immediately felt that he just had to go. He should go and he wanted to go. After a hectic afternoon, he went home to talk to his wife. Now Marie, as the parent responsible for taking care of their four children, while he was conscious for a while, um, uh, and so they tried to get him to a hospital. They had difficulty getting him to a hospital. And in fact, it took over four hours to get him to a major hospital in Birmingham. No one in authority in Selma would assist to do this, not even the police, which is why it took so long. Reverend Olson held James's hand the entire time in the ambulance, even when he lost consciousness. Marie and James' father flew to Birmingham to be by James' side. He never regained consciousness. And two days later, Marie made the difficult decision to stop the life support machines that was keeping him alive. James was 38 years old. And no one, No one was ever convicted of his death. The three um, men that they did put on trial was acquitted by an all white jury there in Selma. President Johnson and Lady Bird called Mrs. Reeve to offer their condolences. They spoke for about 15 minutes. President Johnson sent a C-130 transport plane to transport Mrs. Reeve and Reverend Reeve's father uh, back when they were ready. Four days later, President Johnson introduced what would become the Civil Rights Voting Act of 1965. It was a direct result of the death of Reverend James Reeve. And President Johnson signed it into law five months later. The second biblical passage I said I would close with comes from the book of Micah in the Old Testament. If any of you know, Micah was a prophet and he discussed what it is that God requires of us, of each of us. Micah answers that question with to trust justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You don't have to be of any particular religion to take Micah's question personally. You just have to be human. You have to have a conscience, have compassion, and have a sense of responsibility for the way you live your life a sense of responsibility to the others that you share this planet with. What is required of us individually and collectively? What should we do? What should be our motivation? The reason we do what we do and in what spirit or attitude do we carry it out? Micah's question was followed by an answer. Do justice? love mercy, and walk humbly. I can think of no greater description of Reverend James Joseph Reed than that, as we honor him today. Our closing hymn will be, We Would Be One from the Gray Hymnal. Uh, feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but please only with a mask on, stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn 318, We Would Be One.
For the closing words, I decided uh, to take them from President Abraham Lincoln's uh, 1863 Gettysburg Address. I think they're appropriate. And it was almost 100 years between these two events, between, um, Gettysburg, between the Civil War and the, and the civil rights struggle that uh, Reeve was a part of. Um, one was to, to make them free so they were no longer in the bondage of slavery. And the other one was to make them more full citizens and to uh, give them the same rights. So these are the words uh, from Abraham Lincoln. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here and have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. Namaste, amen, and blessed be. Thank you, Tinka, for sharing your valuable time and insights with us this morning. It is sincerely appreciated and we look forward to seeing you soon. If there are any of those of you in the, in the audience who would like to stay in the sanctuary for 10 to 15 minutes for questions or to share some discussion or observations from the service, please remain on the sanctuary or online. Please be aware that these comments will be posted online. For the rest of you, you are now welcome to adjourn into the parish hall. So if any of you have any questions more about, um, there was a lot that I left out, <laughs> uh, but uh, if you wanted to know any more or if you have any comments about, uh, about this, feel free to come forward and use the microphone here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you, Tinka. I didn't know his story. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, it's really touching. Yes. Um, what a great man. Yes. I love that he was Unitarian. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Anyway, the, the thing I wanted to say, though, is that the Civil Rights Act is partly why we have this incredible polarization today mm -hmm. because the south was always democratic until that passed and since then i mean racism is just alive and well yeah so i think it's true for all of us the work is not done mm -hmm. so. in doing my research um there was an article in which they asked the children or the family members of um, Jimmy Lee Jackson and Viola Liuzzo and James Reed, whether they thought it was worth it, you know, their, their sacrifice, whether they thought it was worth it. Um, and the daughter of James Reed said, um, yes, she did. And uh, she felt that he was destined, that this was his destiny. However, the sister of Jimmy Lee Jackson um, she, she was a bit more pessimistic. She said she felt that way until recently. And in the last five to maybe five to 10 years, she felt like they're back with the same struggles that they had before. And that, um, the, the advances that had been made are, are slipping away. Isn't it, is what I'm saying here is both 
building off of what you just said and what she just said. These are hard times. You get numb in self-defense. It hurts. When the quickest thing I've ever seen state management uh, do is to run quickly and make sure that you can't give a Georgia woman uh, water on a, 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 a freaking hot day where she's been standing in line for nine hours. It's, I'm still in this fight, but I know I'm slower, stupider, <laughs> tend to need to break down in tears every now and then, but I'm still in this. Fire and air pass away. Earth and water are still in the mix. If there's any rule that says I have to be pretty during this process, <laughs> good luck with that. But if the struggle still needs another ugly, foolish old man, I'm in it. Anyone else? Well then, let's all move out to the parish hall and remember there is our bake sale. So enjoy yourself. Thank you.